Hello, and welcome to Family Matters, a joint production between the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family and the University of the District of Columbia. I'm Dr. Roberta Holt from the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family and your host for Family Matters. The purpose of this television series is to provide ideas that can be useful in thinking about issues that confront families. We focus on the relationship environment in which these issues either grow or are resolved. Today's show is about addictions, whether alcohol or drugs. Our guest has spent her professional career helping families in which alcohol or drugs are a major issue. Working with families from a family systems perspective has provided unique observations about the interactive nature of the process and what it takes to deal effectively with the problem. These observations have expanded options for addressing the problem more effectively. Dr. Ann McKnight has previously appeared on Family Matters. She's been on the faculty of the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family since 1991. While working at the Arlington County Mental Health Center, she developed with others the health with others, she developed an outpatient family therapy and treatment program for adolescents with alcohol and drug problems. Her doctoral dissertation was on addictions, and she has presented numerous papers at professional conferences on the subject. And I'm pleased to welcome you back to Family Matters. I'm pleased to be here. Well, I wanted, wanted to have you here because the whole subject of alcohol is, and drugs are, can be approached from so many different perspectives. There, of course, is the medical, the medical model, uh, what happens medically. There is the, the individual approach that what happens internally. There is the AA approach, which has, we all know the benefits of the AA approach. Um, you have worked with family systems ideas, i.e. the ideas of, from Bowen theory. And I think that that adds another dimension to the whole issue of problems with addiction and how one thinks about them. So I wanted to have you on today to discuss that, not only from the perspective of the patient themselves, but also from the standpoint of the family. And wanted to ask you, basically, what your major observations have been about that. Of, I don't think anybody starts out saying, well, gee, I would like to become uh, an addict of whatever the addiction is, but somehow or other there is a process and the family feeds that process or can help abate it. Um, and what, what do you see as the variables that get into that, that help either make the process better or worse? Well, let me just talk about sort of the conceptual framework about how a family and addiction would, would interact. Um, I, I think that it's clear to most people that someone who drinks too much or takes drugs as, that leads to problems is an individual situation. I mean, an individual does that, a family doesn't usually do it. Um, but I think in observing the family, the family can both be affected by that and can contribute to it. And that I think people are less clear about. They can see the, the problem in the addict or the alcoholic. It's harder to see how the family plays a role in this person's life and what, how they manage themselves, including with addiction. Well, can you get more specific then about how that, that interplay is? Well, I, I'm, and I think there are a number of factors, but one of the ideas would be that we're all part of a family and that family affects us and we affect the family and that would continue to be the case with addiction. It's just that the uh, reactions are often more intense and highlighted. So for instance, I mean there are many different people who react in different ways to addiction, but often in families, the family, are, the family members are very focused on the addict. I'm just going to say addict for the, state, the sake of summarizing this particular problem. And um, they're very focused on them, and in this particular frame of reference, we call that, um, that w they're very focused on that person. Often, the family is also um, trying to help the person. 
Well, the behavior puts the person in focus. And then if you use that word in focus, that means what? The ob Can you define that term about being in focus? Well, they're projecting onto the person. Um, and they're worrying about them. They're talking about them. They're um, trying to, and, and what I was going to say is they're trying to help them often. And the idea would be that often those things can intensify the problem. Well, the, 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 the word focus then has to do with psychic energy in the other, of how much they're thinking about the problem, yes. the other. And talking about it and talking to the person about it uh, okay. and interacting with the person around it. Um, those are two very common things that are talked about that uh, in the field of substance abuse, being helpful to the person is often called enabling, where, where the family members are helping the person so that the person is less motivated to help themselves, and that can lead to further substance abuse. Well, what, do you, what would you say are the major ways that people do enable? Because I don't, I don't think concerned others, in other words, a, con a concerned spouse, for example, when they are doing things, would see or think of themselves as enabling. Yeah, what, absolutely. What, right. I mean, I because think they're before, trying to be helpful. They're trying. They're trying to just deal with the problem. I think that what happens in families. That's why I was saying it intensifies the, the way that the family operates. Is that what would be viewed as being loving or helpful, or um, then as a chronic interaction allows the other person to not step up to the responsibility in their own life. So for instance, a common example is that members of the family would search around the house and look for alcohol or drugs and try to dispose of them, um, or would try to get the person's paycheck before they received it so they wouldn't use it on alcohol or drugs, um, or would manage the finances, or would call the office and say to the boss, you know, my husband is sick today, rather than saying he's drunk. And often those things in the short term seem helpful. You know, I don't want him to get fired or I don't uh, want him to spend money on drinking or drugs. But in the long run, it more and more takes responsibility away from the person who then is freer and freer to use drugs and alcohol. I mean, there's less and less accountability um, at, in that person. And so in this particular frame of reference, it's called over and under functioning, where the family is overly responsible and the, the substance abuser is underly responsible. And that is a reciprocal process that tends to tilt over time until the, um, the substance abuser is no longer really functioning. And then the family is upset and the substance abuser is, is, sees him or herself as a problem. So it, it, it gets in more intense then the longer this goes on. In other words, the, what, what can start out as kind of a mild under over functioning over time gets in the extremes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's usually characterized as a spiral, where the the person uses alcohol or drugs. There get to be problems. The family reacts to the problems by either getting angry or uh, having a lot of conflict around it or being very helpful. I mean, there are a number of different reactions that people have, and then the person is less responsible and more liable to use as part of that lifestyle. Well, when you're talking about the under-functioning and over-functioning, I remember, I think you did a paper one time about a version of that, but it had more to do with sibling position, that the, in having to do with the character, characterization of people, of, the, of their, I think it was your caseload in which the uh, sibling position was involved in it, that maybe the, some of the oldest had been kind of over-determined and were uh, 
overworking, trying to prop up a system and they go under as opposed to an under function or youngest or something like that. Is that, that's my recollection of it. What, what was the details of that? Well, there's several different things you're bringing up, which I think are, are interesting and we could discuss in depth. I mean, one is the idea of sibling position, that in, not in every family is it exactly the same, but that in general, oldest in a family are more uh, goal-oriented and focused and used to organizing, and youngest in a family are more liable to be taken care of in a relationship in an adult relationship because they're kind of used to all the older siblings mm -hmm. taking charge of things. So those are two different sibling positions. And but that would then influence, or does it, that's my question, does that then influence the form that the, that the alcohol use would take? Abuse? Well, in the, in the paper that I wrote, um, I looked at the different ways that addiction can play a role with those two different sort of functioning positions in a family. And um, I mean, I think that that addiction hits a widely um, is part of the lives of a widely um, divergent spectrum of people. I mean, there are some of the most talented people in the world that are alcoholics. Um, you know, you get a number of those Hollywood people that you know have a great career, make a ton of money a lot of uh, heads of corporations. I mean, it's not limited to those people that are on the street. And so you can get some very highly motivated and functioning people who turn to alcohol. In, from my looking at it, um, as a way to kind of slow down. I mean, they're running with a high level of RPMs in their engine you know, 14 hour days, seven days a week, they've got a lot of projects, they're accomplishing a lot. Um, and the alcohol, I think, helps them um, relax. But if it gets to be too chronic and too dependent as a way, too much of a way to relax, they don't have other ways to do it, often it can become an addiction. Then there's another set of people who never really function very well at all. I mean, maybe they sleep in their car, maybe they're, you know, they never worked a whole lot, and then there's people in the middle. And those people, I would say, uh, if they stop using drugs and alcohol, don't necessarily change their functioning position a whole lot. I mean, they may be more stable, they may be more hardworking, but they're not they're still gonna depend on others to, to kind of take care of them. And the oldest tend to be more the, um, the high functioners who slow down. And the youngest, I think, tend to be more people who are dependent and depend on alcohol or drug as a part of the relationship. Well, in the literature, I seem to remember a phrase one time of the person who is, mother, please, I can do it myself. Um, as it related to alcohol, and that would be more the the, the oldest pattern, mm -hmm. I would think. Yeah, I think that's that, accurate. That the more the, but that they they get done in by their um, basically isol. I guess the isolation gets into this. Yeah, and I, mean, I think they're in the one up position. There are two sides of the same coin. I mean, one person would say, "I can do it myself," and they would deny needing others. Mm -hmm. And the other side, I mean, it's sort of the, the polar opposite would say, I can't do it by myself. I need you to help me. And then substances get to play a role. I mean, they're dependent on substance as they are dependent on relationships. And those are two different sides of addiction, although I think there's some people in between as well. But I think it's an important thing to bring up because it, ha it, does, it has to do with this relationship variable. Both of them are connected to people. In other words, it's not unlike the uh, program we did on obesity, in which I think uh, B. Flynn was saying that it's not about what you eat; it's about what goes on in the head. Oh, and absolutely. It, and um, this 
is another version of that, except it's, it's adding the social dimension to of how much you do or do not need others as one of the variables that gets into that that kind of is a substrate around it, around the problem. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. Yeah. I mean, I th there's a lot of debate about, you know, what is the origin of addiction. But I think the way I've thought about it or observed it, and there's always exceptions to the rule, but is that people use a substance, and it can be food, it can be drugs, or it can be alcohol, or there are other things, that in order to compensate in some way emotionally in their lives, and I think mostly that plays out in relationships, you know, to compensate for being too isolated or to compensate for being too dependent. And that over time, if one does it too chronically and relies on it too heavily as a coping mechanism, it then begins to take on a life of its own so that you can't get up in the morning without you know, a couple of beers, that kind of thing. That it, it then, the spiral begins to go where, to happen where you're using it more, the problems are more, you're using it more as a coping mechanism and it spirals into addiction. Well, from your years of experience in dealing with this, what, what variables do you think get into whether a person is able to be successful in dealing with, their, with an addiction? Or uh, I, I'm saying a person, let's say a family, since it is, I mean, since it does involve the, the family and since you have done family work, let's use that as the base of understanding. Um, what I mean, are, I, I think if that's you could, a hard if you could one do a, to if answer. If you could do a, a profile of the situation in which it is, uh, the, it, people are successful. What are the what what must they do to be successful? How would one even think about going, what needs to happen? Well, those are slightly <laughs> two different questions, but let me say the first one. What what is the profile of someone who's successful? I think the profile of someone who is successful is someone who is going to lose something important if they don't change their behavior, which is where the enabling and the, and to, and the family being too helpful to them comes in. Well, that's where a good eye position by the other, whoever the other is that they are surrounded by, can can help in that process. Then help Absolutely. facilitate. The I process. mean, to have, and I think it can include the family. I think it often includes the workplace. I think it it can include society. Mm -hmm. You know where you know, whether it's a DUI and the person has to go to treatment or the employer says you need to change this or you will no longer be employed or the family can take what we would call an I position. You know, I can no longer live with this. You know, and you can do whatever you want, but I am going to leave you if you don't continue, if you continue this. Um, that that e any of those things can be, can I think help to sort of focus what's going on in a person's life. But I think the people, I mean, my observation would be that the people who are the most successful have some kind of relationship system if they become sober that is a resource to them. That could include their own family that they grew up in. It could include a, a spouse or a partner. Um, I think for many people, they also consider, you know, a 12-step group to be part of that mm -hmm. relationship system. I think that's key. I think, you know, there's some societies, like in, in tribal areas. I know I went to visit a, a tribe last year in, in Washington uh, State, and they, the tribe has a whole process of of welcoming, I mean, they do it with drumming and other rituals where they, they welcome the people who are coming back into the tribe in recovery, you know, and that is a relationship system that they are seeking to sustain with that person and uh, help them um, be reunited and related again to the people that are important. 
Do you have any thoughts about the difference between the person who can literally stop cold turkey and just do it on their own versus the ones that go in therapy? Not really. It's, it's a population that you obviously would not see. But there are people who in society who can make up their mind. I, had a, I was driving home the other night and I had the car radio on and they were interviewing people to, that if you had had a drinking problem and had been able to successfully stop uh, on your own to phone in. And one after another, people were phoning in and they just, quote, all of a sudden made a decision to stop and they did. Mm -hmm. Now, how many of these people really did and how many that really didn't uh, is up open for debate. But I th it raised for me interesting questions about the role of, of therapy or help and what, what can the, what, what would be the difference between not, not the, the people who are doing that, uh, and, but also what then is useful and how would therapy, does therapy contribute to a person trying to, to stop their addiction? What, what are the variables that you think contribute to that? Well, I mean, uh, there's obviously many answers to that. Um, but I think in terms of, of, of thinking about families and people who are successful, I think that there are two things. One is, is the family fairly clear about where they stand with the problem and what they're going to do in their own lives? Are the family members clear about mm -hmm. what they're going to do in their own lives? And then is the family there to be connected to the person when they stop using? Well, when a and person stops using, it changes the whole dynamic right. of the system. So that those, I mean, I see a man in my practice right now who stopped. You know, he just said at one point, I'm just not going to drink anymore. But but his wife was in the process of leaving him. You know, I mean, there, he was bumping up against something that really troubled him as a, that came partially as a result of his drinking. Now, he never went to AA, and he says, maybe I'll drink again someday, but so far it's been three years, and mm -hmm. I haven't wanted to do that. Um, if she hadn't gotten as upset about the various parts of the marriage, would he have done that? I don't know, you know. Um, but once he made up his mind, he was, he was able to do that. Not well, everybody think, can. I think that is, but. for me, the missing piece, that when a person pulls up and no longer then are drinking or taking drugs, it does shift all the, dyna the major dynamics in the, in the marriage or the relationship system. And the other one may not congratulate. At some level, they do, and they want it. But at the very deep emotional level, it's almost like they're out of a role, and then the whole yeah. system has to recalibrate. And during that um, process, that I think that's where a family systems approach really adds a whole another dimension to the situation. Uh, that well, that's what I think is, it's so hard if you're in the middle of this in a family to see um, when someone's having, exhibiting problem behavior, irresponsible behavior, it's often hard to see how one can play a part in that. And uh, the other partner can look so competent mm -hmm. and so helpful and so much like what society can extol. And this person, I mean the other person is, that uses substances, can look so irresponsible <laughs> you know, and so problematic. Right. Well, this <laughs> and is, so this the idea that, you know, that both sides need to change is often hard to wrap your brain well, around. Well, that's where, that's where we get then into the whole the understanding of family systems. So I'd exactly. I appreciate your thoughts on this. I'm glad that you came. Thank you for watching Family Matters. Hope you'll tune in again. If you'd like more information about the topic of addiction, you may contact the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family by calling 202-965-4400 or visit the website at www.thebowencenter.org.
I'm Dr. Roberta Holt. Once again, thank you for watching, and I hope this show has been helpful.